Hello everyone, my name is Shubham Gupta and I'm DevOps Architect for Salesforce Industries. In this Apex R session, we are going to talk about Industry DX Workbench and CLI that's used for the SFI DevOps. Quick forward-looking statement that any purchasing decision needs to be made on the basis of what's generally available and not on the roadmap of the actual product. Let's talk about agenda. So in this session, we are going to discuss about DevOps tools for SF and SFI CICD. Omni Studio versus Omni Studio for Velocity, Metadata API support for Omni Studio components, branching and environment strategies. This would be more of a best practices uh, around the branching and environment strategies. Industry DX Workbench demonstration as well. Let's first talk about the DevOps tools for CI CD. Now, there are a few questions that a client should always ask uh, themselves before starting, uh, basically selecting any tools or, or these uh, teams. And those questions are technology already in use by organization. So let's say the client would be running some different applications as well. And if they are already using some of the tools for their CI CD purpose, let's say they are using Jenkins for other application, then they can start building their pipelines on Jenkins itself for these Salesforce or SFI components as well. Cyber compliance is that whether these those particular tools that they are going to use in the uh, pipeline or, or for the CI CD purpose, whether those are security fit or not, whatever whatever compliances the client um, requires to implement, whether those can fulfill those, uh, those compliances or not. Skills in the team, now this is very important point, that the tool selection should be made on the skills that are available or the if the skills are not uh, available, then we should always try to go for the trainings that are available. And let's talk about the app exchange solutions like Ubado, Gearset, Flossum, and there are many other tools that are available in the market. Now, these these particular tools are ready to uh, ready made solutions for the DevOps uh, for Salesforce and the SFI component. Now, um, let's say if there are multiple trainings also available for these tools. So, let's say if the skill is not there on the in the team already, then once you go for the uh, or purchase the licenses, there are some trainings. Docu proper documentation is available on their documentation side. So team can quickly go through those trainings, documentation, and get all the knowledge, and then they can start using it. So basically, for the advantage of app exchange solutions, uh, are more feature and less time, less skills in the team. Basically, if your DevOps team is not aware about how to uh, deal with the Salesforce or the SFI components migration, they can directly use these tools, go through the trainings, and then start using it as well. Now there are skills in the team, which means that if the if these tools, some of the custom solution tools are already used in the existing uh, for existing applications, then we can start building our own pipelines for Salesforce or the SFI component migration. There are many tools available in the market currently. Few of them are Azure DevOps, GitHub Actions, Bitbucket, Jenkins, GitLab, uh, Amazon EC2 services. So all of these tools, we can start create our own pipeline. These basically uses containers, and then. We can write our Docker images, can basically start fetching those Docker images, and start executing our pipelines. And then we can use some of the uh, static code analysis tools as well and automated testing tools as well. So all of the part, uh, all of these, these particular steps, we can do it in the custom solution. The advantage of custom solution tool uh, tools is like, these are very flexible. I mean, whatever is the requirement from the customer side, you can uh, write your own scripts. So basically we can modify these things according to our specific requirement. The disadvantage of custom solution is we have to write always from the scratch, right? So all the pipeline part and every integration of the tools, we would have to do it from the scratch. Whereas in the Apex Gen solution, the, the ready-made integration with all of these tools, uh, the, the uh, integration with the repositories, all of that is already pre-built. All we have to do is purchase licenses, get the training done, and then start using it. Another important point is budget. Now, Obviously, the Apex solution, as they have everything pre-built, they, they comes with the licenses cost, which is higher in comparison to the custom solution. So according to the budget that is allocated for the DevOps in the project, we client can decide whether they have to go for Apex Change solution or the custom solution. Moving ahead. Now, this is one of the deployment pipeline. I won't be talking about the Apex Change solution. There are a lot of, a lot of knowledge articles, trainings that are available for Apex Change solution. So you can directly go through those ones. From the custom solution perspective, here what we can see is developers are going to develop the code base into their development environment, and then they would have to retrieve the code base. So, what we there are multiple development practices as well. 
uh, there are i mean two different practices that we talk about is one is common development sandbox which means all the developers are going to develop in the same environment and there is another one where individual developer would hold their individual environments right so let's say if an individual developer is developing in the individual deployments uh, sorry in the individual environments and what they have to do is they would have to start fetching the latest code base into their sandboxes or dev sandboxes before they even go for the development so the recommendation is developer first try to retrieve the code base from the repository because repositories are source of truth so they should always go to the repository fetch the latest code base uh, i mean we are not asking to retrieve everything i mean if you can retrieve everything that's well and good but we, we should always try to retrieve the component that we are going to work on so that we, we have the latest version of the code and then the developer should start working on now if the develop all the all the developers are working in the single environment the latest code base, code base would already be there so that from there developers would have to just fetch it now to retrieve the code from the org developers can either use vs code sfdx cli whatever they want to use like right? it's their choice or the idx tool. so in the for the idx i'm going to show you a demonstration as well whosoever is not aware about how to use idx tool in my previous session for fxrs i had all um, shown how to use the idx tool as well so they, basically we can use the idx tool to retrieve the components from the environment dev environment and then we can put it into version control both vs code and idx can be integrated so there are plugins with idx it's direct integration with the repository so all you have to do is you have to uh, provide the uh, clone url and then you can directly just click on button to pull the component to create a branch push your branch right so the, all those such operations are supported by idx similarly in uh, vs code we have plugins for git that's where you can just click buttons and then pull your component, stage your component, commit your components, right? Or resolve your conflicts as well. Once the components are retrieved and put it into the version control, now developers need to create a pull request. Once a pull request has been created, a validation job would be triggered to validate whatever component or feature branch, uh, whatever component they have merged into the feature branch. Mainly it's a delta validation for the components just to ensure that they are, we are not missing any dependencies when we merge these component changes into the higher branches like develop branch or sprint branches. Once the validation is successful, leads are going to approve the pull request. The code gets merged into the main branches like as I mentioned, develop or sprint branches. Then the automated deployment takes over. Now automated deployments in these automation servers, we use, I mean, you would have to use SFDX CLI and VBT. VBT is a tool which is also known as IDX Workbench CLI. And in the past, we used to call it as Velocity Build Tool, right? So we we have to use these two tools to basically start deploying our component changes to the next environment. So the CI CD part would be done via automation server. And the comp, as soon as the merge gets completed, the deployment would automatically get triggered and will start deploying the component to, let's say, the first environment, which could be our ST environment, system testing environment, or the QA environment, which is quality analysis environment. Once the deployment is successful, we can integrate our automation servers with the Jira or Microsoft Azure DevOps uh, as well. And the status can be reflected back into these ALM tools so that the complete tracking uh, is done. And anyone that uh, anyone opens the, uh, let's say, Jira or Azure port, they can see that what's the status of my uh, user story, whether it got deployed or not, what's happening with the um, uh, my user story. Now moving ahead, so this slide basically talks about the Omni Studio versus Omni Studio for Velocity. So here, I mean, this is one of the hot topic as of now. So many people are confused between Omni Studio and Omni Studio for Velocity. Now, Omni Studio also are a specific org where you have, you are storing your uh, Omni Studio component like Data Raptor, Flex Card, Integration Procedures, um, Omni Scripts into the standard objects, right? Now the orgs that don't have the Velocity CMT installed, which means you have not installed anything and you just you have just uh, provisioned the Omni Studio licenses. And then when you, uh, those orgs basically, they, they are the, the, when you try to develop any Omni script that gets stored into the standard objects, yeah? Now these orgs are known as Omni Studio orgs and you are, uh, basically you can enable the standard runtime. I mean, whosoever is not aware about what standard runtime. so We'll talk about we'll talk more about the standard runtime into the next slides. But these orgs have the capability to to basically run the, all of these components in the standard runtime. Now, Omni Studio for Velocity it's similar to what we used to see as a managed package Velocity. 
So if the component refers to the custom velocity object, then these orgs are deemed as Omni Studio for velocity org. These would be uh, keep on using the package runtime. So whenever we execute the Omni Studio, sorry, Omni Script data raptors in the Omni Studio for velocity, it would be using the package runtimes and not the standard runtime like the Apex. How so Apex classes and other things would be using the standard runtime. Now, as the components are getting stored into the custom uh, objects, that's where it is going to use the package runtime. One of uh, next different uh, difference is if the entry name first installed Omni package is present under Omni interaction configuration. Omni interaction configuration would be found under setup. So you would have to go to setup and then you would have to type Omni interaction. That's where you will get the Omni studio settings and under Omni studio settings, uh, you would, I mean, this is under the Omni studio configure interaction configuration itself. There would be entry of first installed Omni package. If this is present, that means your org is Omni studio org. If you can't find this particular uh, Omni interaction configuration, which means you are still working on the managed package and you have the Omni studio for velocity. I mean, I'm talking about the old managed package that we used to install with velocity underscore CMD or velocity underscore INS. The Omni interaction configuration contains uh, object contains Omni studio configuration settings now, in, but in the Omni studio for velocity, those settings were stored in the custom settings, right? Now, whosoever would be using the uh, Delta deployment, they would know that, okay, the in, under the custom setting, general setting, they would be uh, storing their uh, uh, VBT deploy keys and all. So all of the configuration part used to go into the custom settings, but here in the Omni studio, it all goes into the Omni interaction config uh, object. The, one of the huge differences are how naming conventions are done for the Omni studio orgs. In the Omni studio, uh, or enabled org, you cannot basically start creating your components with special characters, spaces, underscores. So this is a restriction with the Omni Studio. And this is, starts happening only when you basically enable the metadata support for your Omni Studio components. I'll show you in the next slide how we can enable the metadata support. So the point is, if you are storing your Omni Studio components into the standard objects, that's where this restriction of the namespace, uh, sorry, uh, naming convention applies. But if you are still using the uh, custom objects, then there's no restriction. Whatever you were doing till the time, you can use underscores, you can use uh, spaces, you can use special characters uh, in, in the naming convention as well of the component. In the previous slide, I mentioned about um, how to turn on the Omni Studio metadata. Now, as soon as you start turn on the Omni Studio metadata, the component would start getting stored into the standard object. And once this button is enabled, you cannot disable it, which means that once you enable uh, it, all your component will keep on getting stored into the standard objects. And then you have the flexibility to retrieve it via SFDX CLI as well. Yeah. So the migration, like how we used to do the migration of the uh, Salesforce metadata like Apex classes, triggers, flows, objects, fields, right? Similarly, all the Omni Studio component can be retrieved via manage, sorry, SRDX CLI, and then you can migrate it to the repository and from repository automatically those would be deployed by SRDX CLI itself. And this basically applies to the FlexCard, Omni Studio, Omni Script, Data Raptors, and Integration Procedure, which are the four components. One important note over here, once you enable, as I mentioned, once you enable the Omni Studio metadata setting, you cannot disable, disable it. After you enable API, metadata API support, you won't be able to create a component, all of these components whose unique name contain spaces or special characters. So you would have to, uh, I mean, you cannot use that previous naming convention anymore. The recommendation is to wait till managed package version 240 to enable the metadata API support for Omni Studio component. Uh, so that you get a stable package where there are, I mean, that's more or less bug free. I mean, uh, and that's where the support is much more uh, flexible in terms of how you are retrieving your component. And if someone wants to package those components as well, right? Someone is working on the unlock packages, then um, basically from 240 it would be a more stable package in terms of the issues that we are having currently. So um, the recommendation is to wait till 240 release. Supported data pack types and metadata. So now the components which are still getting stored in the custom objects that would be referred as data pack types and that's all data, right? So till the time, whatever dev clients are using now, Omni scripts, data raptors, integration procedure along with the EPC component, those are all, uh, all getting stored into the 
custom objects, something like Omni Studio underscore underscore C data raptors. I mean that so that would be stored into it, dr bundle underscore underscore C dr mapping underscore underscore C. Right. So those are all custom objects. Now this particular sheet shows you how uh, I mean what are the data pack types that are supported via VBT or that you can retrieve it and then you can deploy it to the next environment. So these are the data pack types and those are the associated custom objects that you would be able to, I mean, whenever you try to type Omni script or try to fetch one Omni script from the, your source or using VBT, you would see what custom objects it's referring to, right? So on the left hand side, it's the data pack type on the right hand side, it's the object that it is referring to. Now the data pack type folders gets created in the repository. So in the next slide, we are going to see how we are using the data pack types to store the components as well in the repository or into your local. Now in the previous slide I was mentioning about, you can basically activate the metadata API support of Omni Studio components. Now, once you have enabled that button, all your Omni Studio component starts getting stored in the standard object. So here, as you can see, Omni channel settings, Omni data transform. Now Omni, Omni data transform is nothing but the data raptors a standard object. Like Omni integration procedures, Omni, in, Omni integration procedure is nothing but the standard object for the integration procedure. So similarly, these, this is how the mapping is happening, right? Now, as you can see, these are supported by metadata API, unlock packages, it is supported by source tracking. So all, I mean, once you start storing it into the standard object, you have the flexibility to uh, basically package it as part of the, your unlock packages, and then you can deploy or migrate those packages to your higher environments as well. Omni Studio components as metadata. Now, here in the slide, what you can see is how to retrieve your Omni Studio components using SFDX CLI. Now, there, I mean, I, either you can use something like your direct commands, which is SFDX for source retrieve hyphen Q, and then hyphen M is the metadata type. So, in the previous slide, what we have seen is the metadata, sorry, um, uh, extended object names. So, that's how you can retrieve it like Omni Script, Omni Data Transform, Omni Integration Procedure, Omni UI Card. Or we can generate a package.xml like this one, and all of these particular uh, these these particular standard objects or metadata types supports the file cards, which means that you can just put a star and all of your Omni script would be retrieved automatically. Yeah. Now, how these are getting uh, transformed? Like Omni integration procedure was previously known as uh, integration procedures. Data transform used to known as Data Raptors, Omni Script, same as Omni Script, Omni UI card, which is now we are calling it as used to known as Flex cards, right? So if you are creating the package.xml, then we can run the MD API retrieve command, or you can basically use the MD, uh, port source retrieve hyphen X command as well. So both both works in the similar fashion, or you can directly use the metadata type names. Now, if we are storing the velocity components or the Omni Studio for velocity components in the custom objects, right? Then what happens is we have to keep on using VBD because SFDX only supports the standard objects, right? Sorry, I mean, SFDX only supports the retrieval of the Omni Studio components, which are uh, now stored in the standard objects. So if we are storing in, still into the custom object, the existing client who are still using the managed packages with velocity CMT, they would have to keep on using the VBT tool. Now, VBT supports both. It supports this Omni Studio for Velocity as well as Omni Studio as well, which means that if you want to retrieve, if you are still storing your components in the um, standard objects, where you have enabled that button, which I was showing in slide three or four, which means your components are into the standard object. And the, if you want to retrieve it, you can still use VBT, right? Now, this slide shows you how we can retrieve the components using VBT. So there would be a project path. This project path is similar to, if you are aware about how SFDX CLI works, it needs SFDX project.json file. So in that particular file, there's a, a field called as default path or path, right? Now, the, mostly that path or by default, that path is force app or Salesforce underscore SFDX or whatever you want to name it as, it's just an alias. Similarly, here VBT uses it as project path in this job file. So this is this particular file is called a job file, which is used to retrieve the components or deploy the components. Yeah. So first of all, what I'm telling to VBT is I want to retrieve or deploy the components from this path, which is called as velocity. Next option is git check is equal to true, which means that I want to do the delta 
till the deployment now git check comes into the action only during the deployment and we'll talk about the delta deployment further but all you have to remember is git check if you if you won't put git check in your job file the delta deployment won't start automatically yeah so if you are putting it here which means that the git diff would be performed automatically a delta package would be created and that would be promoted to the next environment auto update setting this is added by default so you don't have to worry about it anymore auto retry errors this is very important uh, uh, flag so auto retry errors uh, flag enables vbt to automatically retry the errors that it is getting during the deployment so let's say there's a parent child relationship um, let's say on a product and if you are trying if vbt is trying to deploy the parent product first then obviously it is going to fail because the child product is not there so the references cannot be inserted so once the child product has been inserted vbt if this option is over there if, if this flag is being mentioned in the uh, project or job file VBT will automatically try to retry the failure of your parent and then it will directly insert it, right? Because the child is found now. So that's the advantage of using auto retry errors. And once this job file uh, is created, we can basically uh, retrieve the components. I mean, the, actually the retrieval would be performed via either IDX or via uh, uh, VS code, right? Once those components are retrieved in the uh, via vbt that those would be stored into velocity so velocity is the same path which is mentioned in the project path and here is what uh, these are the data pack types so here is you can see attribute category omni script object layout object class all of these were mentioned over here as well on the left hand side of the data pack types so then we create a folder structure of the data pack types inside these data pack types we would have the actual data pack elements right so inside the Omniscript folder, you will find all the Omniscript inside the attribute category. We will find all the attribute categories as well. And once we have retrieved it, then in the pipeline or via local, we can execute SFTX for source deploy command to basically, if, if you are if you have enabled the metadata API support, we can use SFTX CLI. If not, then you can directly execute velocity tag deploy using this particular job file. So this is the reference of deploy underscore delta YAML. This is the job file name and alias is the uh, alias of your target of so we can create the alias using either idx vs code or via command line with the help of command force or uh, uh, sfdx auth web login or you can use whatever uh, method of login you want to use right we can use jwt authentication method all we need is the alias of the target of now folder structure i was talking about in the previous slide so it's similar to that one you have the uh, project path then your data pack types folder and inside the let's say for omniscript you will have the omniscript component which is handset by english in this case and inside this part you would have all the json files now vbt retrieves most of it com most of its component in the json format there are few components which are having the html file css file javascript files like templates layouts right but most of the component you would see into, into the json format now there's a file you would find out everywhere which is called as datapack.json. I personally call it as a parent file because PBT reads or parses all the child JSON files using this datapack.json file because you will find the references of all these JSON file into this datapack.json file. So PBT reads the datapack.json file, parses all the child JSON file and then does the deployment. Now if we have enabled the support for Omni Studio components as a metadata uh, right by, by enabling that button then what you would see is you if you try to retrieve those uh, components via package.xml or via metadata api using sfdx cli you would see the folder structure would be similar to how we how we see the uh, folder structure for other metadata types like there would be a path which would be either force app or whatever alias you would have given and main default inside that there would be a folder called as omniscript this would be in the same directory where you would find the classes objects flows workflow rules other comp profiles permissions and other component you would have a folder structure folder called as omniscript and inside that you would see all the omniscript as well now the difference is all of these are in the json format and in the um, petadata api format the default format i mean the the extension is xml so you will see that these component files are getting omniscript files are getting generated inside uh, as a xml file now here there were multiple files, but these are all different XMLs, which means these are all different Omni scripts, right? Now all the references of the elements, 
everything uh, steps everything would be mentioned in these xml files itself so to deploy let's say if you want to deploy demo engineering gen garden english omni script all you would have to do is either you can put it into the package.xml and then use the pack de uh, source deploy command or you can provide hyphen p main default omni studio omni script slash uh, this complete file name and then use the pack de uh, source deploy command via fdcl and then, the, then your omni script would be deployed let's quickly talk about vbt tool i mean vbt is similar to or counterpart of the sfdx cli for the um, sfi component or omni studio for velocity component or even the omni studio component if you have not enabled the metadata api support yet so all you have to install the installation what you have to do is similar to like how we install the sfdx cli by using npm install hyphen g g is for global uh, so the command would be npm install hyphen g velocity that would install the latest version of vbt uh, into your local or wherever you are trying to install if you want to install any specific version then you would have to say npm or type npm install hyphen g velocity at the rate and the specific version number now once you have installed it to see what are the commands that are available you would have to go to velocity oh, sorry you would have to type velocity help and that would show you what are the commands that are available like pack export pack deploy pack get all available exports there are many things that you can do with the vbt itself you can even execute the javascripts into your target org you can yeah, execute the uh, anonymous apexes into your target org so those are the things that you can perform via vbt as well for more information there is a, a github page for vbt you can go to this particular page and then you can see how to use this tool how to retrieve these tools the data pack type that i was mentioning some of the known errors as well so that all information is there in this particular github page another pain point that some of the clients would already be facing or basically uh, they might have observed is the lwc activation during the um, sorry lwc component generation during the activation of omni scripts or flex card so now if you are tired of basically below screen where you would have to wait for like hours just to see whether my lwc component is getting generated for my flex card or omni scripts or not now the vbt 1.15 plus version supports the local compilation of the uh local compilation of the uh, omni script or flex card that generates the lwc component and finally after the deployment it basically deploys the lwc component using sfdx cli as well so you don't have to wait for this much of time because what happens is the lwc components are generated locally and then once your your lwc sorry flex card and omni scripts are, are deployed normally like just deploy activate and finally the references of those lwc component would be deployed at the end of your deployment which basically as all the lwc component are getting deployed together so there are very less chances of any dependencies that might be missing and another advantage is we don't have to wait for individual omni scripts to be activated right so previously also the flex card whatever we were activating using puppet here those were getting activated uh, all the flex card were active getting activated together but in this case omni scripts would be I mean, the lwc component of omni script would be to deployed together that saves a lot of time now how to use this particular local compilation method it's via using npm auth key so this on pm auth key you can raise i mean whosoever doesn't have this one or needs access to this particular repository they can raise a support case and request for npm authentication key now to you once they get their npm authentication key they can keep it in the job file something like this so project path auto retry errors max step max step is something whether you want to retrieve the dependencies or not if it is zero which means that it won't fetch any dependencies and by default it's minus one which means it is always going to retrieve the dependencies now similarly you can put npm auth key flag over here as well add whatever key you have got uh, from the support team compilation compiler version i have mentioned it over if required because vbt tries to fetch it automatically from the target org and tries to download the compiler version of the same package version if not or if you are getting some errors then you can basically hard code a compiler version as well that i want to retrieve 238.0 236.0 vbt will try to retrieve it and then basically compile all your um, uh, omni script and flex card generate the lwc and will try to deploy to the target org now in terms of the timings this particular local compilation is very fast but in the next slide we are going to see another way of generating i mean in the next versions or the or the next releases you would see that there is no requirement of using either of these ones flex card and omniscript run in core 
now this is only applicable for omni studio at this point of time and only when there is a metadata api support as well as the standard runtime support for the uh, omni studio components so in previous slide there was a point about omni studio component can use standard runtimes as they are stored into the standard objects and the advantage of using standard runtime is you don't have to generate those awc components so if you are getting these errors over here that would be resolved in the next version of our um, um, uh, omni studio um, uh, packages right so what's we are what what is happening with with the winter 23 package this is still safe however we no longer generate custom component which means the compilation time drops to second so you you would see that your deployments is happening and there is no requirement of generating the lwc component so because of the lwc component we used to get a lot of errors as well while migrating the component like let's say one omni script is dependent on some other lwc component or custom lwc component so it used to during the migration it used to give us a lot of errors and if you are using puppet here sometime it used to hangs as well so all of those errors would go away right all of those issues would go away and then flex card and omni script can run against the source code with the standard ui runtime embed new flex card and omni script component in the lightning app builder or experience builder as per your requirement once you have enabled the standard runtime part similar to how you how i've shown you a button which using which you can enable the omni uh, studio metadata api support similar to that there is a there would be another button with which you can enable and that can be used for um, using uh, or basically enabling the standard runtime for the Omni Studio component. So it's just what with the click, uh, click uh, buttons, how we used to enable any other functionality in the Salesforce office. Let's talk about the branching strategy now. This is one of the branching strategy which I personally recommend to the client. So in this is known as uh, the GitFlow branching strategy. What we, uh, um, the branches that we have in this particular branching strategies are develop branch, release branch, master branch, and obviously there would be feature and bucket branches. So develop branch and master branch would be long running branches. Release branch can be long running or short lived branches as per the requirement. Feature branches, bug fix branches would always be short lived branches. So the workflow would be developers are going to cut out their feature or the bug fix branches from the develop branch merge fetch their changes if you remember the slide number two where i was showing or slide number three where i was showing the uh the, the complete pipeline or the developer workflow using the tools they would be retrieving their components using one of the tools like idx pbt sorry idx ps code or any of the clis they would have to put it into their feature branches and once they have put it into the feature branches they would have to create a pull request from their feature branches or bug fix branches against the developer branch once the pull request has been created, a validation would be triggered. And that validation basically will try to validate the data component that I have created or I have created one Apex class. It will try to validate whether all the dependencies of my Apex class are there or not, whether the compilation is perfectly happening for my Apex classes uh, or not. And along with that, it will try to fetch all the depend, sorry, will will try to check all the dependencies as well. And other checks would be uh, done as like code coverage checks, static code analysis on my code. If there are velocity components, Omni Studio for velocity component, it would try to deploy. I mean, these are the things that we can do in the validation itself. It would try to deploy into one of the all. Now, Omni Studio for velocity or components are still data. So we would have to deploy them in order to identify whether there are validation errors or the deployment errors or not. Yeah. Now, if you have support enabled the support of the uh, metadata API, then you can still validate your Omni script uh, without deploying it, right? So once all of those validation parts are done, Leads are going to approve the pull request. The code would be merged into the developer branch, and then the pipeline will take over and start deploying to the next environment. Once we are ready with the uh, code to be promoted to, let's say, your SIT environment, we are going to cut out a release branch from the developer branch, and we will promote the code to SIT and then finally to UAT. Let's say if there is a bug in SIT or UAT in any of these two environments, developers would be cutting out a bug fix branch from the release branch. They cannot fix it, it uh, here anymore. Because in the developer branch, the code will keep on changing, right? So let's say currently they are developing for Sprint 1, then uh, they will start developing for Sprint 2 as soon as we cut out the release branch. So we are not sure that the component that they have developed for Sprint 1, whether that has changed for Sprint 2 or not. So instead of going into that particular discussions, how we can handle those things properly in the same branch, we can cut out the uh, bug fix branches from the release branch, merge it 
I mean, fix the code into one of the dev environment, which we used for the previous or this particular release development, fix it over there, merge it back into the release branch, deploy to SID, then to UAT and keep on doing it until we get a UAT sign up. Any bug fixes, which are directly done into the release branch that needs to be back merged into the develop branch so that everyone knows about how, what we are fixing for release branches and they, we are not overriding any code base uh, via uh, a sprint to code base or release to code base. Once we get a UAT sign up, we are going to merge our release into the master branch. Some clients prefer to merge their code or, or basically their release branch with the master branch after the production deployment. That's perfectly fine, right? There are no issues with that one. So either you do the deployment via release branches or you do deployment to production via master branch. Once your master branch release gets signed off, then we deploy to pre-production or staging environment. I'll tell you the use cases for uh, why I'm asking you to uh, deploy to pre-production after the production deployment, right? But the recommendation is to deploy to pre-production or the staging environment after the uh, deployment of production. And then any bug fixes or any hot fixes, I think we'll talk this uh, about the hot fixes in the next slide. So this is the git flow branching model. That is, uh, that's what I recommend. And, and basically what, that's what I've experienced as well. That's the best fit model for uh, parallel development. Now, about our Salesforce environment, this is more of an environment strategy according to the licenses. So generally there are four licenses available. Develop, developer pro, partial copy sandboxes and full copy sandboxes. Now, these are the, I mean, most of you would already be aware about these particular sandbox types, right? But I'll give you a quick overview of what's the difference between these sandbox types. Um, so develop, develop pro, partial copy, full copy sandboxes. Now, usually with unlimited edition, we get 100 developer licenses, five developer pro, one partial copy and one full copy sandbox. The difference is how these gets spinned up, right? So all of these gets spinned up from production, but what gets copied from production to this sandboxes? So let's say if I'm trying to create one dev environment from production, it will only have the metadata and the configuration that's there in the production. So no data would be copied to developer and developer pro licenses because the main reason is because of the storage, right? So in partial copy sandbox, if I try to create one partial copy from production, I would have the flexibility to copy some of the data as well. When I say some of the data, you can, you can basically, so for partial copy sandbox, we need to create a template. In the template, we can basically select what are the components we want, or sorry, what are the records we want to retrieve for custom object or standard object. So you cannot select the individual record, but you can select the object name itself and randomly 10,000 records would be copied. Max 10,000 records would be copied into the partial copy. Now partial copy comes with five GB of data storage. That's why you have the, we have the ability to copy data as well. Some of the data as well from production. Full copy sandboxes are similar to production. The data storage is similar to production. So that's where when we try to create one full copy sandbox, all the data gets copied from production as well. Developer is just 200 MB and developer pro is just one GB. Yeah, and please remember no data gets copied when we try to create it from production. If you are cloning these environment, cloning can happen only with the similar license, which means that I can clone my dev environment with the same dev environment, dev pro from the dev pro environment. So the point is in cloning, everything gets copied as the licenses are same. So metadata and data both gets copied, but when you create it from production, no data would be copied to developer and developer pro. From the refresh cycle intervals, Developer and developer pro can be refreshed daily, but the partial copy set box can only be refreshed uh, five days uh, in, during the interval of five days. I mean, once you've created a partial copy set box, the next time that you can refresh it after five days and full copy set box, the refresh interval is 29 days. So accordingly, we would have to use our licenses. Now here we got build phase, test phase and production. Now in the build phase, let's say if multiple develops are going to work in the same environment, then your dev environment would be dev pro. If we are uh, assigning one single environment to individual developers, then they can live with the developer licenses as well. Now here you can see our STO queue environment. I marked it as dev pro, which is green in the color. I've shown uh, the legends as well. SIT can be your partial copy or full copy sandbox according to the licenses or the data that we have to generate. Similarly, UAT can be, I mean, your partial copy, if you have only one partial copy sandbox and uh, then you, you would have to go for 
either SIT or UAT for the partial copy sandboxes. And then you, your UAT would have to decide what sort of testing you're going to perform, right? And accordingly, we would have to select the license as well. Pre-production staging environment. If you are going to use a pre-production or a staging environment for performance testing data migration activities, then the recommendation is to go for full copy sandbox for the pre-product staging environment as well. Now, performance testing should always be done on the full copy sandboxes itself because of the data that we would be generating, right? Partial copy is just 5 GB. So that might not fit for our purpose for the performance testing because in performance testing, we would have to generate a lot of data. Similarly, for the data migration activities as well, please try to use the full copy sandboxes so that we don't get the data, data storage issues. In the dev environment, developers would be developing the code. Then the code would be promoted to the ST environment. Each build team will also have a system as test ST environment for early testing. Generally, these two environments are non-integrated environment and the licenses are dev or dev pro. For the testing phase, SIT is where the testing team will perform testing of the features, progressive testing. UAT's regression testing uh, is performed where we are promoting the releases. I mean, you can perform the regression testing in both SIT and UAT as well. There's no restriction, right? So UAT is more from the business user testing perspective. The licenses could be partial copy or full copy license sandboxes or licenses depending on the availability of licenses, whatever licenses uh, we have purchased from Salesforce. These two environments can be a mix of integration or non-integrated. I mean, mostly SIT and UATs are integrated environment. Generally, full copy and partial copy, as I mentioned. Now this production, sorry, pre-production environment, I mentioned it after production and the previous slide also I had mentioned it after the production because what happens is this environment can be used for multiple purpose without impacting our current release. So this particular path is called as part to production. Let's say if you are already testing release three and then in production you have release two and there is a bug in release two, which requires urgent attention, which requires urgent fix. So what we have to do is we would have another hotfix environment where developers would be having the access. Obviously, you cannot provide your uh, access to your staging environment, SIT environment, UAT environment to all the developers. So to gain the access, they would have to log into hotfix environment. Now, production, pre-production, or the and the hotfix environment would have the similar code base, right? The data would be different, obviously, but the code bases, the configurations would be similar. So whatever bug they are getting into pre -pro sorry production, they would be able to replicate in pre-production as well as into the hot fixing environment because of the similar code base. They can fix it into the hot fix environment, put it into staging environment. The testing can be performed in the staging environment itself. Staging environment can be your, I mean, if you are going to use it for uh, for for uh, bug fix hot fixes, then it needs to be integrated environment. Once you have tested in the staging environment, we can then promote it to production. Now here, as you can see, your release four testing is still going on. And for release two or release three testing is still going on. For release two, you've already fixed a hotfix, right? Without impacting this. So that's the advantage of having a separate environment. Now, in the same environment, when it is when there are no hotfixes and, 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 and other things, we can basically do a performance testing. We can do uh, data migration activities. There are many use cases for the staging of pre-production environment. Now, once the hotfix is done, we would have to ensure that we are back merging that hotfix into the release branch and the develop branch so that the lower environment can get that hotfix as well. So that when we deploy the next release, we are we, we, we can ensure that we are not going to override the hotfixes that we directly apply to production. So back merging is again very important. We'll quickly talk about the Git Delta deployment. Now, the, how we do the Delta deployments, right? So Delta deployment, this is the basic principle of the Delta deployment. I mean, there are multiple tools that are available like SGD, which is SFDX Git Delta. There is a Velocity S tool, which is written as by our team. I mean, that's not supported officially, but yeah, I mean, we, we still use it. Um, if you if you want to, it's, op it's on open source, right? Again, so you can use it as a SFDX plugin. Yeah, so this particular two, uh, so, sorry, the basic principle is, let's say for the first time, whenever we are trying to deploy uh, from a specific branch. So let's say, let's take an example of deploying the code from release branch or uh, develop branch to SIT. So in this case, I've taken example of branch X. For the first time, whenever I'm trying to deploy, everything would be deployed from this branch to SIT for the first time. And the after the successful deployment, the C3 code, uh, sorry, commit hash, which is the head of my branch, would be updated into this environment. Now you can store it in either in custom settings or if you are using 
some specific you can basically create your own object and you can store it or by default if you're using omni studio for velocity it it, it, it stores these um keys or commit hashes into custom settings general settings or i mean you are free to you store it anywhere yeah all you have to do is you would have to provide the reference of those keys where you are storing it by default bbt stores it into the uh, custom setting general setting now for omni studio component it would be storing it into the omni ui interaction configuration that's where it used to store the bbt deploy key now for the next time whenever we are going to do the deployment bbt is going to retrieve i'm referring here as bbt because bbt out of the box supports your delta deployment but if you have to use sfdx cli uh, to to do the delta deployment then you would have to use some plugins like sgd or velocity yes tool that generates the deltas on the basis of the same principle and then you can use it so what bbt is going to do is or any other i mean these plugins are going to do is it is going to retrieve the commit id from the target dog so in this case let's say there are three more new commits happened on this branch x now when we are going for the deployment a c3 commit id would be retrieved from the source sorry from the target dog a git dip would, would be performed like c6 minus c3 we'll get the delta for c4 c5 c6 and only this would be promoted to the next environment after the successful deployment c6 would be stored again into the target dog so this will keep on tracking of what components we are deploying let's say if you remove or revert any commit id i mean if you revert it obviously the previous commit id would be present at well now if you are rewriting the history of your branch make sure to update your uh, keys as well i mean you can directly go to custom settings or wherever you are storing these keys and modify the commit ids if you are rewriting the history of your branches yeah just to be ensure that your deployment don't fail because of those changes now we'll quickly talk about the idx workbench now in my as i mentioned in my previous session i have already mentioned about idx workbench there are a couple of things that we have to keep in mind when we are using idx for omni studio and that i'll talk about in the next slide now whoever doesn't know about how to use idx workbench um, first of all we would have to create a repository i mean this can be integrated directly with your repository so you can either clone your repository using idx or we, what we can do is we can clone the repository by using git uh, cli we can write type a command like git clone and the uh, cloning url that we get from the repository into a local and then we will we can just provide the path of that repository uh, into this particular section and then your then your that path would be integrated with the uh, idx tool source can be your org or the repository so in the next slide i have use cases for uh, idx workbench as well target again can be your either repository or org and then project so project are very important and that's where you specify what component you want to retrieve using idx so use cases are what uh, how you can use idx if you want to migrate things from org to org you can use idx workbench your here your source would be an uh, org target would be an org as well if you want to migrate things from org to repo now this is the com most common use case for the developers they would be developing in their sandboxes and then they would be putting their component changes into the repository so the source becomes my development or target becomes my repository now let's say if i want to retrieve something back into my org let's say there's a hotfix that i want to fetch into my org what i'm going to do is i'm going to put repository as my source and target as my org so i can migrate those changes from uh, source to target in the project what you can do is here you got uh, you can see that uh, we have all the data pack types for the um, sfi component and then you got the metadata type as well so basically this supports both metadata as well as the data pack types right you can retrieve it so as soon as you click on the fetch data packs it would show you all the component names that is that are present in your org you can basically select the component move it to the right hand side click on save button and those component would be retrieved and you can see those component differences as well now this is the um, major advantage of using idx workbench that even before you merge something you can basically see the differences how it looks like uh, um, by comparing it between source and target so let's say if you're comparing between uh, source and target you would be able to see the changes in this comparison tab here as you can see if i merge this component i'm going to change this change to code to change to code to right so it basically compares things and then it shows you the differences as well during the runtime itself let's say if you want to make the changes if you want to discard some of the changes let's say you and one other developer is working on the same apex class and you have retrieved it and you don't want to migrate it completely what you can do is 
you can click on view source you can modify or remove the other developer changes and then only migrate your changes so all you can do this during the runtime itself um i'll quickly show you how idx workbench works okay so this is my idx workbench here first of all what i would have to do is i would have to store my repository so let's say if i want to add a new repository i can just click on new repository and then it is going to retrieve the components sorry it is going to read that repository or start retrieving or deploying the components from this repository then one of my source or the uh, target is my repository over here and then i can create a new project so i just have to click on a new project button then omni studio demo and then i can select the omni script and let's say one effects class I'll click on fetch data pack. So what it is going to do is it is going to retrieve me the names of all the Omni Studio, sorry, Omni script components and the Apex classes that are available in the org. And once it has retrieved all of those things, I can basically select those components and then move it to the left hand side and then basically start uh, retrieving those. So here, as you can see, there are six Omni scripts available in my org. I'm just going to select one of this and 31 Apex classes are here in my org. I'm going to select this one. Here, this button, if I don't want to fetch the dependencies along with these two components, then I can select this one. If I want to fetch the dependencies as well, if I'm not sure what other things that I have to deploy along with these two components, that I'll just leave it as it is. I'll click on save. I'll click on save again. Now, what this particular tool is going to do, it is going to retrieve the components from the source and check whether these components exist in the target or, uh, as well. If those components are available in the target, then it is going to compare and show it to me on the left hand side. There are three colors that we see in the left hand side. Uh, the first one is green, which means the component is new. That component doesn't exist in the target. If the cam uh, component color is shown in the, I mean, there is a small circle which shows the color as well. If the, com the component color is in the ember, which means that component has been modified in between source and target, right? So that's where you can click on the component name and there in the comp comparison tab, you will see what are the changes that are uh, different, uh, what are the changes that are there between source and target. Third one is without any color, which means that there are no changes. You don't have to actually migrate this component because there are no changes between source and target. So here, as you can see, it is calculating the difference, which means that it is trying to check whether this component exists in the target or not. Now, once it has calculated the difference here, it is going to show me whatever changes are there. If there are no changes, which means that it would, it won't show me that uh, it would, these are without any colors, which means that there are no changes between source and target. If there would be so changes, it would have shown me here in the green color or the ember color. I can just select this particular component and then I can click on migrate. So this is going to migrate to the target. Now, for, if my target is my repository, we would be able to see this Git icon as well. And that's the icon where we can basically commit my changes directly to the repository. I can create new branches. I can pull the branch. I can push the branches. So all the um, uh, tasks we can perform it from this uh, particular tool itself. So let's say I've created a new branch. I pushed my changes. I've committed my changes. And if I click on the push button, it is going to push my changes from my local to the repository as well. So that's how you can use IDX workbench. So let's say if I want to, along with this one, let's say if I want to make some changes on this particular Apex class, I can click on view source. I can actually modify some of the things from here itself. So here, as you can see, this is editable. And once I perform my changes, I can click on save and only those changes would be migrated to the target so this is like a sort of it becomes id as well where you can modify something and then you can fix it or if you don't want to use this one you always have the option to go for vs code or the actual clis back to the slides some key points for the omni studio so currently only idx workbench alpha version supports the omni studio as data packs right so if you are going to use the idx workbench version then you can retrieve those Omni Studio component using the IDX itself, but you have to use the alpha version. The GA version currently doesn't support the Omni Studio. IDX Workbench CLI, which is VBT, uh, version 1.15 supports the Omni Studio. So if you are using previous versions of ID, uh, VBT tool, then that wouldn't support the Omni Studio component. Migration of the Omni Studio components like Omni Scripts, the integration procedure, data raptor, flex card into an Omni Studio for velocity or the velocity managed package orgs isn't supported, which means that the component which are stored in the standard objects, 
you cannot migrate back them uh, um, you cannot migrate those components back into the custom object but the vice versa is still true which means that you can retrieve your stand, uh, custom object component and then you can still migrate it to the uh, standard object and vbt does support that idx alpha version would be supporting that as well vbt now supports the local uh, lwc compilation of the os and flex card via npm repository the, the slide that i was showing you and I, I basically was recommending you to use npm auth key you can uh, see that vbt now supports that as well so this is just a summary of what i have explained previously even when we migrate the omni studio component via the sfdx cli so this is only about the current release so currently we have the 238 version as the ga version right so this is only true for this particular version that currently if you want to if you will try to migrate your uh, omni studio components like omni script data raptors even though via metadata api if you have enabled the support and you try to migrate it by sfdx cli you would have to still uh, generate the lwc comp uh, components now there is one statement that was made into the previous slide that in um, winter 23 you won't have to generate the lwc components right explicitly so that would be changed i mean you if you are working on the standard objects and if you have enabled the standard runtime support you would see your compilation is happening automatically into the target dog as a standard runtime compilation right you wouldn't have to generate the lwc component now most of the clients who are still using vbt sorry velocity managed packages and using vbt to migrate their component they would have to eventually move to the standard objects right to to get the advantage of push upgrades and other other things that are on our roadmap so to to basically um, these are some of the best practices how you can do that how you can migrate from the custom object to the standard objects go to set up omni studio settings confirm that omni studio metadata is enabled so this will enable the metadata api support remember about the naming convention that i mentioned in the previous slide install sfdx plugin and perform the data migration so there would be a plugin which would be released with 240 i mean this is available now as well but with 240 there would be more enhancement to this one omni studio migration that would be called as and then we can basically just provide the metadata types that we want to migrate from custom object to the standard object and that would be done automatically replace your embedded flex card and omni script with the new standard component so now you have the flexibility to uh, uh, basically replace your flex card and omni studio with the new standard component that would be uh, that would be uh, triggered in the standard runtime so basically you will see a huge difference uh, between the execution timings as well start from the sandbox so don't try to directly do it into a uh, higher sandboxes like sit uat what you can do is how we used to plan our releases right from the development environment similarly you can create a development environment try to migrate stuff from there and once you have uh, again some hands on knowledge on okay how to do this what are the issues i might be getting how to fix those issues then start migrating your or, or basically performing this migration activity into your, uh, to your higher environments test different between custom managed package runtime and standard runtime to be sure that okay whatever we are migrating gives us some of the advantages right once testing is complete deploy sandbox to production i mean eventually go to the let's say sit first of all sd or q environment then sit then uat and then finally to production and then to pre production so that's how your migration should progress um that's all i have for this session thank you guys thanks a lot for uh, listening to this thank you bye